Jeremiah was a prophet who warned the people of Judah for many years concerning their eventual destruction because of idolatry and sinfulness. Now, as many prophets of Israel were, he, um, he was ignored by the people. And in order to negate his preaching, many other self-appointed prophets preached that all was peace and prosperity. So while Jeremiah was warning the nation that a terrible calamity was about to come, uh, others rose up and said, ah, don't listen to that guy, everything will be fine. We're all good, it's all good. And Jeremiah's response to these false prophets is found in uh, the 23rd chapter of his book where he says the following, is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer which shatters a rock? Therefore behold, I am against the prophets, declared the Lord, who steal my words from each other. Jeremiah 23, 29 and 30. In other words, only the true word of God has any power, and God opposes men who simply quote each other and attribute their quotes to Him. History shows that Jeremiah's prophecies were indeed true, and like the fire and the hammer that crushes rock, the Babylonian army marched in and destroyed Jerusalem exactly as God's word through Jeremiah had predicted. Now this story illustrates why I am not afraid or ashamed to say, because the Bible says so. Amen. I'm glad that Harold selected that, selected that song this morning before I got up to preach. I'm not afraid or ashamed to say, because the Bible says so when questioned on certain issues or challenged to defend my reasoning. You see, it's not just any knowledge that will result in experiencing God's power. Only the knowledge of His word can lead a person to the true knowledge of Him and consequently His power. You know, general or scientific knowledge won't do it. Knowledge of various religions won't get you there. Studies about God or about Christianity or the discipline or of theology cannot provide the experience of God in our lives. Only knowledge based on God's word will produce a genuine experience of God and a genuine experience of His power in your life. And the reason for this is that the power of God is revealed and experienced in His word. To know His word is to know and experience His power. And the reason I say that, I'm talking about power, is because a lot of times there doesn't seem to be a lot of power emanating from Christians. So that you can know what to look for. I'd like to review with you seven powers contained in God's word. And without wasting any time, let's go to number one. Seven powers of God's word. Number one, God's word has the power to reveal. Genesis 1.1, the word of God has the power to reveal to us certain things that we could not know in any other way. For example, how and when was the world created? And why, why is man the way he is? In other words, sinful. Why is that? And what is the true nature of God? And what happens to us after we die? Human beings would study and speculate on these things for a thousand years and come up with a lot of theories but that's all they would be, just theories, because no one could really know this. But God's word gives us an eyewitness, truthful and detailed account of these things and many more that we could not know in any other way. And so God's word has the power to reveal things to us that we could not find out in any other way. Number two, God's word has the power to refute, to refute. Second Timothy 3.16, Paul says, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, 
training and so on and so forth. In other words, God's word is a standard against which all philosophies, all ideas, all solutions for the human condition can be measured for accuracy. If God's word approves it, we can run with it. If God's word rejects it, nothing we can do will make it work or make it acceptable or make it right. Note that moral standards and spiritual ideas are always compared to the Bible in order to define and judge their value. I'll give you an example. We don't ever compare butter to margarine. You've never heard a commercial where they say, you know what, this tastes just like margarine. Nobody does that. Butter is the definitive spread. You compare all the other, somebody said amen, good for you. <laughs> you're the man or you're the woman, I love it. I mean, you know, all the spreads out there are compared, it tastes just like butter or close to butter, but the same thing as butter but less fat and so on, but it's always compared to butter. Butter is the standard. Well, in the same way, the Bible is the standard. The Bible cannot eliminate immorality in the world, but it is the standard by which we judge and prove if something or someone is moral or immoral. It's how we de demonstrate if something is worthy or unworthy, because it has the power to refute. Thirdly, the Bible has the power to reproduce. Luke chapter eight, verse 14, you know the parable of the sower? Jesus said that the word of God was like a seed. And the analogy was that the word had the power to grow or to cause growth to happen in an individual. The word planted in an honest and obedient heart can produce actual physical acts which can be seen and which can be felt. God's word planted generation after generation will produce Christians will produce the New Testament church century after century after century. How do you think the New Testament church has survived for over 2,000 years? Because God's word has the power to make something grow. The only way Christianity has survived intact for 2,000 plus years is because of the reproductive powers contained in the word of God. The only actual thing we hand down from generation to generation is the Bible. And the only thing that we as a church, as the church of Christ, the only thing we hand down from generation to generation is the responsibility to be faithful to the Bible and not to add to it and not to subtract from it. That's our task for the next generation. And so the Bible has the power to make things grow. Number four, the Bible has the power to redirect Peter says in 1 Peter 2, for you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Every complete life change, every turnaround that I read about or hear about has one similar element, God's word. Someone began reading God's word, that was my own case. People say, well, how, how, did, you, how did you become a Christian? I mean, you, know, you were in Catholic Quebec, you know, how did you do that? What's the secret? I said, no secret. One day I was on a train and I was on a long train ride from Montreal to Vancouver, you know, 3,000 mile train ride. And I was broke. I couldn't afford, you know, this, this was before iPods and iPads and stuff. I couldn't afford too many books. So Bibles were on sale for $5 in the, in the railroad, you know, in the, um, in the train station at the bookstore, was on sale for five bucks. And I had never read the Bible before and I figured, oh, all right, I'll be able to knock this off between now and Vancouver. <laughs> That's how I became a Christian. I just started reading the word of God. Or someone started a Bible study with someone else, or someone heard a lesson or a word of encouragement based on God's word, or somebody got a DVD, or somebody watched a program from a church or, or, or something else. Now many people have improved their lives or have changed their lives in a significant way. 
History shows, however, that only God's word has the power to completely transform and redirect one's life in a totally opposite direction. A good example is C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis was for years a brilliant writer and professor in England. He was also an avowed atheist. He was converted and eventually became one of the most prolific Christian writers, especially in the area of Christian apologetics. What happened to him? He read God's word. One of his books entitled Surprised by Joy was when it finally clicked on him. It clicked. Oh, oh, Jesus is God. Ah, oh, what a change. God's word has the power to transform us into a new person with a new purpose and especially a new direction in life. Power number five, God's word has the power to revive. The psalmist says, in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. The word of God is able to bring comfort and hope and strength and encouragement to those who are in sorrow, to those who are suffering, to those who are discouraged. We can't count how many times or how many people have read Psalm 23. Imagine if you had the rights to Psalm 23, every time it was spoken, every time it was read, every time somebody quoted it, every time somebody looked at it, you got money, you'd be the richest person in the world. Regardless of a person's faith or faithfulness, when a person dies, I have learned from experience that the family expects and needs to hear words of encouragement from God's word. I'll tell you something, it's interesting to note that hospital patients and grieving widows and lonely shut-ins never request Darwin's theory of evolution to be read to them. And when I go to the hospital, no patient asks me to read for them from the TV guide. They want to hear God's word. Because even though their body is sick, even though their body is broken, God's word has the power to revive their spirit. It's always the reviving word of God that they need and that they ask for. God's word, number six, has the power to reward. The Hebrew writer says, of those who come to God must first Believe that He is and He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. The Bible tells us that the creation and our conscience are two different ways we can find God. Romans 1, 19 and 20. And yes, we can discern that an intelligent and powerful being um, designed and created this universe. We can tell that simply from our reasoning factors and from looking around. Our conscience helps us to understand that this God, this creator of humans, is a moral God and one who is pure and good for uh, that's, that's what we consider in beings higher than ourselves. But there is no comfort in knowing God in this way. There's no specific joy, simply an understanding of how we fit into the whole. You know, through my conscience and through reasoning, I can figure out, well, yeah, there is a God and there's somebody higher than me and somebody made this world. Okay, so what? The world, however, teaches us who God, the word rather, teaches us who God is and what uh, He desires from us and what He is preparing to give us beyond what He has already given us. In other words, the Hebrew writer says that God rewards those who look for Him and the way to look for Him is to ask for Him in His word. The reward we get for looking for Him there is that we find the real Him there is that we find what His will is there, is that we find a relationship with Him there, is that we find salvation there. God's word is the bonding mechanism between Himself and His people. It is our greatest gift. It is our most precious reward. Is there anything better than knowing exactly what God's will is for your life? Is there any better feeling to know I know exactly what God wants me to do in this situation? 
How many times have people said to me, I'm praying and I've been praying and I'm, you know, I'm asking God, what is your will? I'm just not sure. Is it A, is it B, is it left or is it right? Do I go up, do I go down? Which way, Lord? Tell me, please. What strength and power we have when we understand what God's will is for us. And the only place we find that is in His word. And then finally, God's word has the power to get us ready. Luke 12, 40, Jesus said in Luke 12, 40, be ready for the Son of Man is coming. Whether we believe or not, all of us will meet God one way or another. Either we die and face Him in judgment, or Jesus returns and we all face judgment. Either way, we need to be ready. The word of God is the only source of information that can help us prepare for this sure event in our lives. I mean, let's face it, you, uh, Brother Dayton, was he not reading about this individual who passed, 41 years old? You know, you get to be 70, 80, whatever, you're thinking, well, I'm getting close to meeting my maker, you know what I'm saying? What, 40? I never heard anybody at 40 say, well, I'm getting close to meeting my maker. We, we just don't expect it. 41. The word has the power to do this, to get us ready, because God in His word shows us how to get ready for that great day in our lives. For example, He explains how Jesus has redeemed us. The Bible explains that the death is caused, that our death is caused by sin and how Jesus has redeemed or paid back our debt to God on account of sin by dying on the cross. That's the core message of the gospel. You're a sinner, you owe God a moral debt and Jesus has died on the cross to pay off your debt once and for all. That's good news, you couldn't know that any other way. He also calls us to receive Jesus. Our debt for sin is paid. Our souls are saved from hell if we receive Jesus as our Savior and Lord and we receive Jesus and His blessings by believing in Him as the Son of God. And then God encourages us to repent. His word is full of examples of those who receive great blessings because of their humble obedience and repentance. And the word tells us that the true faith, true faith is demonstrated by sincere repentance, Matthew 3, verse 8. And then the word of God demands that we relive that cross of Christ. To prepare for the day of judgment, we must relive the day of atonement by being buried in the waters of baptism. For every person who has asked, what must I do to be saved? The Bible answers clearly in Acts 2.38, repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Man, what great news! All of my sins gone. All of my sins gone. Every single sin gone. Gone for how long? Gone for forever. And I receive the Spirit, why? Because the Spirit will resurrect me, will revive me. And the word of God provides regeneration in Romans 8 verse 13. The word enables us to receive the spirit of God and the spirit provides the strength and the ability to live the Christian life faithfully and productively. The word is made alive in us through the Holy Spirit. And the word prepares us for our own resurrection. By announcing the resurrection it draws us to Christ and when we are in Christ the word educates us concerning our own resurrection. Without the word of God, we would only speculate about life after death, but the Bible actually prepares us for that life. And the word also fashions our lips for rejoicing. Who knows how to act? Who knows what to say as an eternal being, fitted for a new body and a very different existence in the heavenly realm? I don't know how to live in heaven. Do you? But God's word gives us the words of praise, the songs of joy that we might begin now, rejoicing in the life that we have in Christ and the eternal life we will experience with Christ when He comes for us. Only the Bible gets us ready for heaven. Only the word of God has the power to get us ready for a world we cannot see 
and hardly imagined, but one which is swiftly coming upon each and every one of us. I pray that everybody here, whether you're 20 or 40 or 60 or 90, I pray that you are ready for life in heaven. Of course, the fact that there is power and realizing what that power can do for me and knowing where that power is found, that's not enough. You know, I have a lot of electrical outlets in my home that provide power, but they're useless unless I tap into them. It's the same with God's word. Unless we tap into the power in the proper way, all of that tremendous power will do us absolutely no good, will not produce anything in our lives. You need to understand that this is the connection between knowledge and power. If we know the word, then we experience its power. When we experience its power, we experience God's power. That's the connection. That's the connection. Tapping into the power of God's word requires several things that everybody can do. Number one, we have to read the word. Isn't that simple? You could have wrote this sermon, couldn't you? We have to read the word. The basic connection that begins the juice flowing is made by reading the word of God. This is why we have so many ways to encourage the church to read God's word. You know, our regular Bible reader, you know, in your, little, your card, your attendance card, RBR, regular Bible reader, are you a person that has the habit of reading God's word every week? Just a reminder to help you build up that habit. You know, the goal is not to read a, 10 chapters a week. The goal is not to read the whole Bible in a year. The goal is to make reading God's word a regular part of your day, like having breakfast is a regular part of your day, or watching the five o'clock news is a regular part of your day. Well, a regular part of your day is reading God's word. Once you feel the power of the word surging through your life, reading the word will come naturally as part of your everyday lifestyle. Number two, tapping into the power of God's word also requires us to Respond to the word. Respond to the word in obedience. You know, there's a danger in thinking that if we read the Bible, we've done God's will. We read the Bible in order to know God's will. Obedience is what changes knowledge into action, and action is what makes our lives different than what they were. Powerful living comes from powerful obeying. I repeat that. Powerful living comes from powerful obeying. And then finally, tapping into God's power requires us to spread the word. Obeying the word brings the power into your life. Sharing the word multiplies that power in the lives of other people. We share the word by example and by teaching others, by sharing our faith, the gospel with non-believers, by serving others in the name of so many ways to share our faith. When we share the word, we empower others to know God and we empower them to empower others to do the same thing. You know, the Bible is the most printed and distributed book in history, and yet millions remain unconverted, and many who claim to be Christians are lukewarm and unproductive. An interesting and ironic thing, I listened to a, um, a report once on the radio, they were interviewing the general manager and superintendent of the largest printing operation in the world, that prints Bibles. That's all they do is print Bibles. This printing operation is located in China. And the manager, the superintendent of this big huge printing operation was boasting how many millions of Bibles that they produce a year. Millions upon millions of Bibles that they produce every year, the biggest company you know, in the whole world that supplies Bibles is in a communist country. And then the interviewer said, uh, have you read the Bible? No, he said. No, 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 no time, no time. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> You're responsible and in charge of producing more Bibles than anyone else in the entire world and you yourself don't have the time to actually read it? The sad thing is that there are some people in this country who have 10 Bibles lying around in their house, 
but never pick it up to read it on a regular basis. I believe that these facts reveal that even though the word is out there, the majority of people have not yet tapped into its power. We think it's a duty rather than an opportunity. So I think that most people at this point would say that this lesson is mostly informational. A sermon that highlights the various elements of power contained in the word and how to access that power. Of course, you'd be right. That was the purpose of this presentation. But on a personal level, however, the lesson asks each and every one of you to reconsider. Reconsider your own experience with God's word and ask yourself if its power to reveal and refute and reprove and redirect and revise and reward and ready you for heaven by redeeming your souls, receiving Jesus, repenting, reliving the cross and baptism, regenerating your spiritually, resurrecting your body and rejoicing your heart, I ask you to reconsider if the word is really powerful in your life in any or in all of these. If not, then maybe the simple reason that you have not properly tapped into all of this power that God has put at your disposal through the knowledge of His word, maybe that's the reason. Perhaps the true purpose of this lesson has been to move you to react in some way. And in the context of my lesson, the proper biblical reaction would include reading your Bibles on a regular basis. There's no power without knowledge and there is no knowledge without the study of God's word. You know, I've looked at the stats, I always like to bring in the statistics. According to our RBR statistics, only 13% of our congregation read their Bible on a regular basis. We only have 13%, we're working on, imagine if your car was only working on 13% or your air conditioner was only working on 13%. Can you imagine? My thought is, imagine everything we're doing on 13%. Imagine what we could do if we were at 90%. Maybe your reaction should be, not the reading part, maybe it's in the obeying part. You know, let God's power to redeem and restore and regenerate flow through your spiritual veins by obeying the word, and here's, I'm talking to all of you, but now I'm talking to you as individuals. If we had the time, you know, I'd point each of you out. You know, I'm talking to you. You know what you have to do. You know it. You and God, you both know what you have to do. And sometimes the reason that there's no power is that there's no obedience. Only the gospel can show you the way. And so we encourage you, obey the gospel if that's what you need to do. Obey the spirit and be restored if that's what you need to do. Obey the Lord and be faithful if that's what you need to do. But you know what? You know what you have to do. Do it. And then finally, maybe it's time to take a step forward in your maturing process and begin serving and giving and leading more as God would have you. You know, we have a, a saint here, Alan, uh, who, who's retired from his work here because he has other work. He served well for many years. Maybe it's time for some young blood to come up here. We need some young legs. Maybe it's time for the next generation to get on the horse. You know, Marty's not getting any younger. <laughs> and we don't call our elders elders for no reason. When I was young, I used to complain. Then when I got a little older, I got involved. Less complaining, more involvement. Less criticism, more serving. Maybe that turned the boat around. You think? Whatever the reason, if you need to respond to God's word, tap into that power, I encourage you to do so in whatever way you know that you have to this day as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.